We're just going to start to my left and go down the line. I'll introduce everyone as they speak. Our first speaker is General Jim Armour, who is a Director of Government Relations for Northrop Grumman. Preceding this position, he was Staff VP for Washington Operations, Orbital ATK, where he coordinated policy licensing of space launch systems with government departments and agencies. <coughs> Excuse me. Part of that, his VP for Strategy and Business Development at ATK Space Systems, where he was responsible for the market development of small responsive satellites, satellite components, and related engineering services. There, he helped establish an entirely new commercial space market in on-orbit servicing, as well as engineering systems supporting NASA and DARPA space robotics. Before that, he was founder and CEO of the Armour Group, which provided consulting support to government and industry space programs. He is currently appointed by the Secretary of Transportation as a member of the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee, or COMSTAC, advising the FAA Commercial Space Office on space launch policies and regulations. General Armour served 34 years in the Air Force in a variety of space leadership and staff positions, including Director of the Navstar GPS Joint uh, Program Office, Director of Acquisition and Operations for Signals Intelligence at the National Reconnaissance Office, and as a military payload specialist for the Space Shuttle. He served as director of the National Security Space Office in the Office of Undersecretary of the Air Force at the Pentagon. And uh, in my opinion, I'm biased about this. He, one of my favorite things about him is that he previously served as an advisor to the Secure World Foundation. <laughs> thank you, Jim. All right, Th thank you, Victoria. Good morning to everybody. I'm happy to be here. If you could roll the video, please. You can kill the music. <laughs> Yeah, so in about five months, early next year, we're going to Space Logistics LLC, which is a subsidiary of Northrop Grumman, will launch its first mission extension vehicle. Um, it is a docked life extension satellite servicing vehicle. It'll dual launch with a commercial ComSat as it transitions from low Earth to high Earth orbit using electric propulsion systems. It will deploy its mechanisms. You see the communications arm and the two EP thrusters. There it will rendezvous with a client. It uses waypoint um, automated approach. So all of the, both the client and the MEV operators will stop at the noted waypoints, make a decision to go or no go, and then the vehicle advances on its own to the next waypoint. The last waypoint is at about the one meter point at which time a little mechanical lance inserts into the nozzle and opens small fingers in the throat of the Apogee kick motor, pulling the vehicle together. You get a light tension with the stanchions up against the launch ring. There we will conduct um, docked, we'll stay docked as long as the client wants us and perform the guidance navigation and control, accurate pointing, position keeping. As part of our responsibility to be a responsible space operator, we've done extensive full-scale development and laboratory testing and validation of our system. We will need a lot of space situational awareness capability. You can go to the slides now. Uh, next slide. Uh, to operate this, uh, this system. Um, we've been working on the licensing for about seven years. I mentioned to Kevin O'Connell that yesterday. Um, we have an FAA launch license. We have a NOAA remote sensing license, which was then augmented by non-Earth imaging uh, aspect of that, that license. We have a FCC license for our orbit, for our spectrum use for debris management, and we have an uh, agreement with our client for frequency sharing. Uh, we also went through various interagency processes to the Department of State uh, to make sure our trade, export, and ITAR uh, were compliant, um, as well as compliant with the various treaties, including Outer Space Treaty Article 6. Um, in fairness, it didn't just take seven years. It, it was a learning experience for both the government and us, and we redesigned our system several times during that seven years as we learned more, so it was only fair. I don't want to put all the blame on, the, on a slow government process because it was a joint and actually very positive uh, relationship. 
Um, in addition to the U.S. licensing, we also honor the client's state regulations. Not all of our clients are U.S. clients. Um, so um, I'll let you read the chart, but the SSA that we need to operate was sort of displayed in the video. Uh, we'll be using the, the CSPOC provided plus some commercial augmentation to get into the proximity of our client. Uh, at that point, we will transition to a relative navigation and uh, automated approach by the waypoints I mentioned. The final approach within you know, the, the last 100 meters or so does use imagery uh, feature matching for both range and orientation uh, in the visible, the IR, and laser imaging. So we have a lot of redundancy in the system to make sure that we're behaving in a responsible way. Speaking of which, um, our mission flight operation safety rules are that we rendezvous in proximity operations and dock only with our client, um, and they must be fully witting and aware of you know, the, the joint operation. Um, we are cognizant of space uh, sustainability. We don't want to create any debris, so we minimize the flight rule risks as we approach. We have highly trained crews, including training on contingency operations if things don't go exactly correct. Our basic theory, of course, is just do no harm. We will share best practices uh, with the community as we, as we do this, and overall, our approach has been one of cooperation, responsibility, and transparency um, as we pursue this uh, standard business practices. We'll follow rules and regulations. We're, our engineering will include fault tolerance, testing, and validation. Um, we'll be transparent in our regulatory notifications and public notifications, especially in the neighborhood in which we're operating, and I'll look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Jim. All right, so our next speaker is Colonel Ke um, Kevin Amstan, who is the commander of the 3rd Space Experimentation Squadron, 50th Space Wing, Shriver Air Force Base. In this role, he leads the Air Force's only unit for space-based demonstrations and experimentation. In addition to developing operational concepts, for current and future space systems, the squadron recently operated the Automated Navigation and Guidance Experiment for Local Space, or ANGELS, satellite, managed the Multi-Mission Satellite Operations Center ground system, and oversees operations of the X-37B orbital test vehicle. Colonel Amston entered the Air Force in 1999 through the Reserve Officer Training Course at Brigham University. His background includes various duties in intercontinental ballistic missile and space situation awareness operations as well as research development, test and evaluation, and satellite command and control. He was a lead orbital analyst for Operation Burnt Frost Satellite Engagement, a service chief's intern at, the demand at DARPA, and an executive, sec um, executive officer for an Air Force Scientific Advisory Board study on the extended use of space se sensors. Prior to his current position, Colonel Amstan was the Chief of Safety, 50th Space Wing, Shriver Air Force Base, where he provided safety oversight for 175 Department of Defense satellites with associated systems valued at over $66 billion. Colonel. Thank you very much. Uh, that was actually daunting to hear, um, but I enjoy listening to that again. It was good. Um, it, it's an honor to be here. Uh, Aloha. Uh, this, this is such a prestigious conference. Um, the, the reason why we're on this island and the space surveillance that, uh, that has uh, occurred here and, and the expertise that exists in this room right now, it, it is, uh, it's humbling uh, to be at this table, so thank you. Um, I wanted to provide a little, a little context of, of how I got here and, uh, and, and frankly, my decision to, to support this. Um, and it starts with uh, Lieutenant Amsden and Lieutenant Whedon, who's sitting over here uh, at Vandenberg Air Force Base in 99, showing up at undergraduate space and missile training, which no longer exists. Uh, following which we both went to Malmstrom Air Force Base to do our missile tours and, uh, and studied space studies through the University of North Dakota, so any UND alumni out there, there you go, uh, where I think we did uh, asteroids, meteorites, and comets together, if I remember right. Um, clearly two space geeks, and we ended up going to Cheyenne Mountain to, at the time, the Space uh, Surveillance, or excuse me, the Space Control Center in Cheyenne Mountain in the first Space Control Squadron. Ironically, towards the end of that, uh, I believe I was Brian's last supervisor. Uh, two squadron commanders, I think, are in this room, Colonel Mike Mason, Colonel uh, Mark Vidmar, and we all worked for one Colonel Stephen Whiting, who uh, I just saw two stars walk out of the, out of the room. So it's, um, it's, it's really cool to be, to be here together in such a, a unique uh, perspective. Um, 
Brian, Brian obviously parted ways after, after Cheyenne Mountain, uh, met a certain young uh, Canadian officer who's sitting in the front, front row now as his wife. And I think as uh, Goodwill Hunting said, he had to go see about a girl, something, something like that. So he ended up going off to Secure World Foundation. I went off to, uh, to, to Vandenberg and, and, uh, and then ended up um, coming to take over the third space experimentation squadron. Now, uh, I, I have a lot of data points to back this up. Pretty much no one knows what we do. And, and I, can, I can tell you that's, that's, there's, uh, that's accurate. No one knows what we do. Um, Brian approached me about the possibility to come and talk about um, what we do, uh, having flown angels. Thank you, Orbital ATK, right? Having, having flown angels and some of the things that we were doing, uh, while, while there are many uh, efforts to talk about doing rendezvous and proximity operations, and we've done RPO since Gemini and Apollo Soyuz in the 60s, right? But doing RPO at the geo belt is a little different problem set. It's just the, the SSA required, um, the, the skills, the, the tactics, techniques, and procedures uh, are a little different. So as one of the only units in existence that's doing RPO at the geo belt, uh, certainly I was intrigued about doing that. However, as we saw on the panel on Wednesday, one of the, one of the great questions that our esteemed colleagues that were on the panel there um, received a question about how, how you maintain the, the national security needs from whatever nation it is that you're pursuing, how you maintain the national security needs that, that, that you require while at the same time balancing that with situational awareness. And, and, and I learned that early in my career that there are, there are two camps, and, and those two camps have equally, equally good endeavors, good pursuits. The, the one camp of situational awareness wants to share and, and make sure everyone's aware. Those who are doing the national security want to protect and defend, and, and, and we each have those good efforts. And the balance, I'll tell you, is, is, is tough. And, and the panel did a great job responding um, that every nation certainly has a right to their, to their national defense, and, and, we, and we need to keep that. Um, General Whiting started off this conference with a great analogy of the Battle of Trafalgar and Admiral Nelson having a tactical advantage that led to a strategic win for their, for their country, and I, and I respect that because a lot of the things that I'm a tactical commander, I, a lot of the TTPs that we're doing with rendezvous and proximity operations at the geo belt are very tactical in nature. Um, so after Brian approached me about this, the, the two camps I knew would be a conflict, those on the security side would, would, would uh, not exactly be thrilled about me sitting on the stage, uh, never make them happy. Those on the situational awareness side wanting to share information would ne you know, pretty much feel that I could never share enough. Um, so I think I found a way that I could do this, and I, and I, and I believe in this discussion, and, and thank you, Victoria, for, for teeing this up, this discussion about um, best practices and, and the SSA required for performing rendezvous and proximity ops and, and some of the exciting missions down the pike. Um, the Air Force, and, and in particular the Third Space Experimentation Squadron, should be at the table. We should be able to talk about the things that we're doing, and, and so I wanted to be here. So uh, with that, I'll tell you, I wanted to share a few tactical things, a few things that we're doing for rendezvous and proximity ops at the Geo Belt, and I will reference the unclassified, publicly available Air Force fact sheets that anyone can find on the missions that we're flying. So we currently just completed missions with ANGELS last year. Um, we support the Geosynchronous Space Situational Awareness Program, GSAP, with tactics, techniques, and procedures that we share with our sister service in, in the first Space Operations Squadron. Uh, literally lessons learned from angels that we make sure that they are aware of. And then right now with our esteemed colleagues from the Air Force Research Lab who, who currently own uh, the Eagle and Mycroft missions, uh, we, are, we are supporting by, by flying those with them from, uh, from Kirtland Air Force Base. So uh, uh, just a couple tidbits to, uh, to catch any questions that you can find out, uh, find out about these. So angels was launched in 2014. Uh, was literally designed for autonomous navigation. So some of the things that uh, Jim was just talking about, um, coming from a 50 kilometer standoff distance down to within just uh, several kilometers from, from, the, from the RSO. We in the third space experimentation squadron uh, received that when AFRL was done with the mission um, in 2016. And we used it to develop uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures that the Air Force needed. So my squadron, uh, I described that we, we bridge the gap between research and development that clearly Air Force Research Lab does and, and operational missions like OneSOPS or, or, or the Second Space Operations Squadron flying GPS. Uh, we're somewhere in the middle. Uh, I, I like the analogy I once heard of, of we're somewhat akin to, to 3M where they don't make products but they make products better, right? We, we don't make satellites, we don't make satellite programs, but, but we make them better. We, we take what was designed for research and development 
And we see how we can operationalize that. We see how we can use that operationally to meet Air Force Space Command's needs uh, for future missions. So we exploit best practices, we exploit tactics, techniques, and procedures, we develop those so that we can use on future missions. We completed experimentation with ANGELS in November and, uh, and, and terminated that mission. Um, passed on, again, lessons learned to ONESOPS, flying the, the GSAP mission so that uh, we could work together on, on lessons learned. And then uh, back in April, the EAGLE and MICROFT missions launched, so this is now the first propulsed ESPA ring. Uh, so, so we now have the, the same ring that ANGELS deployed from, but now is propulsed and moving around the geo belt, and so we were figuring out the tactics for, for flying that successfully. And then Mycroft built on the success of ANGELS and was able to deploy, was designed to, to deploy from about 35 kilometers from the RSO, the resident space object, and then moved down to a, approaching one kilometer. So again, looking at how we ingress, how we egress, how we fly those missions. And, and again, those are all publicly available things that you can go find out there. Um, wrapping up in, in conclusion for, for opening remarks, uh, I, I believe as we have, I, I know that as we have flown the various missions that we have in the past and are currently flying, um, that we've executed safe and responsible operations. That is, that is first and foremost. I, I mean, literally, as, as Victoria alluded, I was the chief of safety for the 50th Space Wing for all missions, all, all, of, the, all of the assets that we are flying at Schriever. So between GPS and their MILSATCOM satellites, so orbital safety is, is critical to everything that we, that we plan. Um, happy to, uh, to have developed some of the things that we've been able to do and, and show how we continue to do space, uh, excuse me, safe and responsible space operations moving in the future, and look forward to any questions I can answer. Thanks, Kevin. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Tom Kubancic, who is the General Manager of Commercial, Civil, and International Space and the Vice President of Advanced Programs at L3 Applied Defense Solutions. Mr. Kubancic's entire career has been focused on advanced technology with over 30 years in space systems, high performance computing, and microelectronics. As a recognized international expert in SSA, he has participated in the research, development, and deployment programs since the 1980s. At L3 Applied Defense Solutions, Mr. Kamancic has led the transition away from military-only SSA, establishing a broad portfolio of research and development, commercialization, and operational support programs. His team harnesses a company-wide passion for problem solving by leveraging a world-class research portfolio with exquisite analytical capabilities and deep operational experience. Mr. Kapancic is an active participant in NATO science and technology panels and activities leading to better understanding of global approaches for effective collaboration, effective coalition and collaborative SSA. He is a published author in Global SSA and is a frequent speaker at domestic international conferences, including this one. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, and uh, really happy to be here today. Uh, as I was uh, preparing for today, a number of my friends in the audience were all saying, hey, say something controversial, you know, say, you know, take it off the rails, you know, go, it's, it's the last day of the conference, you know, go juice it up a little bit. And um, listening to what you, you know, my, my background and the fact that I admit that I've been in the industry since the 80s, I was been wondering, are they trying to accelerate me into retirement by, uh, by encouraging me to, uh, to go off the rails here? Uh, we'll, you know, our, what we'll try to do today is uh, provide our perspective for, uh, in regarding uh, the SSA environment and in around rendezvous proximity operations. And I think what's important, um, our perspectives have been gained because uh, our organization, Applied Defense Solutions, which is a division of L3, uh, we are deeply involved in research and development and operations. Uh, um, guidance, navigation, and control software on board, uh, the, the ground-based flight dynamics components of uh, spacecraft control, orbitology, the, um, the conjunction assessment, collision avoidance, maneuver planning. So we understand both, both sides of the uh, dialogue, if you will, between a spacecraft and, and ground and what's important there. Um, we particularly like and, and enjoy um, working difficult missions, so rendezvous proximity ops, formation flying, clusters are, uh, are areas that our, our team uh, have, uh, have a lot of fun with and I think we have a lot of competency in. We also, um, uh, over the last couple of years, have uh, moved into the commercial SSA marketplace. Uh, we've built out a, a ground network of, uh, of optical systems, as well as worked on uh, the infrastructure 
to uh, integrate radar and passive RF and optical uh, for customers such as the, uh, the uh, project, which is the non-governmental SSA project at the National Space Defense Center. And um, depending on um, the, how much data the government is wanting, there are, there, are, uh, there are some days that we deliver as many observations as the SSN uh, from, from commercial providers. That's machine to machine and um, with known quality and uh, with high reliability. And, uh, we think that's, uh, that, uh, I think as we take a look at that part of, uh, of SSA, we also see that uh, it's really important to understand the, the fact that commercial SSA and the data we provide, um, not only to the commercial community, but to the government, that uh, for it to be actionable, for it to be uh, relied upon, it needs to be robust and reliable. Uh, and one of the discussions we have right now is if a, if, a, if the SSN is part of a weapon system because it supports um, military operations, to what extent is a commercial SSA network part of a weapon system? And if it is, what sort of attributes does it need to have in order to be there and be counted on by warfighters um, uh, as we, as engagements ex, uh, uh, escalate and um, and as uh, things advance. So I think that, I think those are things that we in the SSA environment need to think about more and more because uh, um, there are many components of, uh, of SSA that are going off to the civilian marketplace and that are served by, by uh, commercial companies, uh, civilian marketplace, uh, but there is a core function here which is a Air Force or military function. And so, um, how do we support all of those and do that affordably? Um, so as we take a look at, and as we think about uh, rendezvous proximity ops and SSA for those, uh, we think about those in terms of uh, a couple different cases. Um, one is a non-cooperative uh, uh, SSA, and the other is cooperative. Well, what's non-cooperative? Well, that does fall in the military environment, right? So military operations, either offensive or, or defensive based, you know, uh, uh, are, are you, um, uh, you know, uh, are you operating a system that a, another system uh, has the potential to interfere with or come in contact with? Um, so there's the military aspect, and uh, uh, I think that uh, much of that is uh, well understood by this, by this audience. The, um, there's also those activities of interest that be considered to be the, those of interest to the space traffic management uh, activities, which are non-military. But how do you tell? How do you know um, when a um, when a, when an object is a, is approaching another object and it's non-cooperative? You didn't expect it. It's not yours that you're controlling. How do you know what is it a um, is it a military? Is is it a is it a piece of debris that's uncontrolled? Is it a ill-controlled uh, piece of operational um, system that has um, poor control? Its, oper its operators are, um, are not doing a good job. And um, how easily can you, from the data, from the patterns of things that you've been seeing in the past, discern intent? And so that's important in the technologies and. The, um, the methods that we put together is understanding as best we can as intent, as well as then also being able to discriminate um, uh, where those threat envelopes and, and where you can confirm uh, my, my, what I suspect of the intent, um, when can I confirm that or, or, or uh, when do I need to con uh, consider that I'm still at, at at risk. So, um, in order to, to understand intent, we, we need to have an exquisite understanding of the environment. So, um, that's the natural environment. You know, I think that this conference is, is, um, does a, an excellent job of discussing things like the forces that perturb the environment, uh, what's natural and natural uh, in the motions, um, what can be observed. Certainly, I don't need to go over that. But um, I think it's important for us to understand um, also, uh, on top of that, what are, if someone was um, 
actively controlling a rendezvous prox ops uh, event that was trying to disguise their intent. Um, how, do we, how do we discern what an aggressive versus a non-aggressive or maybe an optimal versus non-optimal strategy is and what does that tell us about, um, about, about the, the event? Um, or also, you know, what's our understanding of, um, of the energy that it may take from get, to, get from A to B and would a, a non-aggressive activity really ever use that amount of energy to, to, to do that? So there is an intersection of the research, of the observation, of spacecraft flight, and of, um, and of uh, spacecraft operation dynamics, which I think is important for the, to come together in this community. So uh, patterns of life, you know, understanding uh, if, a, of, if we observe an event, is there something about the past pattern that may inform us that the, uh, um, of, the, uh, of the threat environment here? Uh, and, in, and as one of my friends um, and members of this conference has always said, if it's debris, how do we know? Debris or not debris? So um, I think the one, um, I think uh, in moving on here, I think it's important for, uh, for cooperative environments and cooperative events for, um, uh, for space traffic management. I think two things. One is that I think we need to consider what the role of a, uh, um, for a cooperative RPO, what's the role of, uh, of flight planning? And that's not only a, a strategy of how you're going to accomplish your mission, but um, how that strategy can be observed. So I think I would suggest these two components, the flight plan and an observation plan. And that observation plan is it's incumbent upon um, the, uh, the organization that is, say, doing the on-orbit servicing to ensure that they can demonstrate that they have positive control and that a regulator or an overseer can see it and can confirm it. Um, or else it just goes into this, this ambiguous bucket of what's going on here. Um, so, and I think the goal of, of, of the regulator in that case is to be able to confirm that the flight plan is probably being flown. Not to step in the way not to grab the stick if something is going wrong, but to provide smart oversight and, um, and uh, be able to confirm that the, uh, the, the strategy was, was followed. So when it, um, when it comes to the observation plan, I think it's important that, that when a, uh, a RPO operation is, is, uh, goes in to be permitted, and the observation plan is approved, I believe that those observations should then be able to flow freely. That um, not only um, to the commercial organization, but to the overseers. And I don't think, and I believe that those need to be held at the lowest level possible. Uh, because we cannot afford to have a regulatory activity that sits at system high. And, uh, and we have to have a good dialogue with commercial organizations and we can't require commercial organizations, we can't break them into being military-like like, um, like, like centers. So um, I think the observation plans need to be considered, and once approved, the data, as long as it supports the plan, needs to flow freely. Um, and, um, and in closing this part of my, my comments, I also want to say that I think that we need to think a little bit differently about our strategy um, between the observer and the observed. Um, basically, just because a observer can see something, I don't think it's their responsibility uh, not to look, okay? <laughs> um, just be, you know, it's you know, a, a couple analogies, right? Well, if you're gonna leave your bedroom window open, uh, dot, 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 uh, but I, I, I think it's important that if someone has the ability to see, um, and we all have a lot of abilities to see, I think that needs to be understood. And it's not our responsibility, just because we have the ability to see, not to look. We will see what we see. I think those who want to not be observed have, an, have a responsibility to figure out how not to be observed. Uh, it was brought up the other day that, you know, that well, the Navy hides aircraft carriers, 
Well, yes, they do, but we can see them, but we don't see them all the time because of their, their concept of operations and, and how they approach the problem. And I think that needs to transfer to the space domain as well. So thank you for, uh, uh, for the time today. All right, our last speaker is on the stage yesterday, Dr. Brian Whedon, who's the Director of Program Planning for the Secure World Foundation, and has nearly 20 years of professional experience in space operations and policy. Dr. Whedon directs strategic planning for future year projects to meet Secure World's goals and objectives, and conducts research on space debris, global space situation awareness, space traffic management, protection of space assets, and space governance. Dr. Whedon also organizes national and international workshops to increase awareness of and facilitate dialogue on space security, stability, and sustainability topics. He is a member and former chair of the World Economic Forum's Council on the Future of Space Technologies, and also is a member of the Advisory Committee on Commercial Remote Sensing to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He is also executive director of the Consortium for Execution of Rendezvous and Sensing Operations, or CONFERS. Prior to joining SWF, Dr. Reed served nine years on active duty as an officer in the U.S. Air Force, working on space and ICBM operations. As part of the U.S. Strategic Command's Joint Space Operations Center, which is now GO 18th, uh, Dr. Whedon directed the Orbital Analyst Training Program and developed tactics, techniques, and procedures for improving space situation awareness. Brian. Thank you very much. Um, so Kevin and I were reminiscing about, you know, what has changed in the 12 years since we were at one space, now, of course, 18th Space Control Squadron, and what has not. So what has changed is, you know, the, the, the complexity of their mission with all the growing international launches and the commercial launches and large constellations. What has not, they're still using SPADOC and CAVENET, and they haven't quite <laughs> been able to replace those yet. So interesting. Uh, so. Today for this particular discussion, I wanted to, uh, I'm wearing a little bit different hat than I have in the past. Uh, Northrop Grumman and the things that, that, that Jim uh, talked about in his video, they're just one of a couple dozen or more companies around the world that are working on commercial rendezvous and proximity capabilities and commercial satellite service and capabilities. And those uh, run the gamut from uh, doing life extensions, such as what, what he was talking about, to uh, potentially being able to refuel satellites, to doing inspections to figure out what happened with a certain anomaly, uh, to being able to reconfigure and, and build modular satellites and assembly. Uh, there, there's a whole host of new things coming down the pipeline uh, that are going to create a lot of challenges uh, because they, you know, they. Uh, as was sort of hinted at by what, what Tom was talking about, you know, these are capabilities that are going to open up a whole new um, suite of, of potential commercial things and business models uh, and, and uh, uh, benefits in the future, uh, but they also involve technologies and capabilities that are, could cause some concerns and could be mistaken or misperceived as something that might be a threat. So how do you balance all that? Well. Um, we are part of a team that is under contract to DARPA uh, to create a consortium of companies that are going to develop standards and best practices for how to do commercial rendezvous and prox ops and satellite servicing. Uh, the program is called the consortium, as Victoria said, the consortium for the execution of rendezvous and servicing operations, or CONFERS. Um, and of course, like any good government contract, we spent the first month debating how to pronounce the acronym. <laughs> And the choices were CONFERS or CONFERS, and our PM told us, no, 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 it's CONFERS, so it's CONFERS. Um, but what we're doing through there is we are working with companies to build this consortium, basically a, uh, an organization uh, and a structure for how to bring them together to discuss best practices and standards. We started with a group of six companies um, that included Orbital ATK, uh, and, and they worked with us to put together basically our charter and how we're going to work things. Uh, we formally launched the consortium in May, uh, and I'm happy to say that we currently have 11 formal members uh, that are companies as part of the consortium, and we have several more that are uh, in the planning and are working on putting in their, their membership applications. Uh, and those members include uh, companies that are providing satellite servicing uh, services, uh, companies that are uh, the clients for those services, companies that are producing 
uh, components or manufacturing the servicing satellites, insurers, companies that are doing the SSA. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a, a broad range of all the different entities um, in the industry side involved in this. Um, and they include companies from the US, but also Canada, Japan, Germany, France. So it is a international group of companies. Uh, and we, what we've been doing is trying to discuss how do we collate all their experiences, what they plan to do, and, and come up with, eventually, standards and best practices. So that started with a research project that we did that looked at existing practices for rendezvous and prox ops. And we had very good input on that from NASA and from the DOD on sort of you know, what they were, were able to share with us from their many decades of experience in both uh, manned and robotic prox ops. Uh, and then from that, we then led into a series of workshops we've been having, uh, one in LA back in May, one in DC in July, and we have the next one coming up in Bremen, Germany in a couple weeks. Uh, and those workshops were bringing together you know, not only government, governmental technical experts, but the experts from these companies to start talking about things. Um, so we have been making progress. Uh, I'll say that we're, we're starting with basically discussions on what sort of principles should all these commercial activities operate under, uh, principles and best practices, uh, and sort of what are sort of the mission parameters they should be following. Uh, and the intent is that that is then gonna set the stage for um, future discussions about more detailed technical standards uh, that we can then use to actually measure those and implement those uh, across the industry. Um, and we are talking about those standards you know, we are not going to be a standards body. We're basically going to be kind of setting the initial drafts. So we will be working with organizations like the International Standard for Organization, ISO, or the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems and Standards, the CCSDS, as potential homes for those standards once they get going. Uh, you know, it, it's been interesting kind of going through this at the time. You know, these companies are, are, are very interested in this. They all, many of the companies see this as an opportunity to demonstrate how they are going to be responsible um, and, and how they are going to go ahead and, and conduct these activities in a way that's going to be beneficial for the satellite community as a whole. Uh, and we think that that's, that's really good. Um, we are also uh, seeing these, what's going on with these industry standards and best practices as informing the government oversight and regulation piece. Um, the, the, the United States under SPD2 and SPD3 have said that you know, they will plan to base future regulations for these activities on industry best practices and standards, which we think is a great approach. Uh, and so we already have been having some initial discussions with uh, a caucus of US government agencies and departments to let them know what we're doing uh, as a kind of a communications channel for, to inform how they're thinking about this. Uh, and I'm also working with the Department of State on talking to uh, other governments uh, because, as I mentioned, this is an international issue and we have companies involved from countries other than the U.S. that are likely to get licensed by the United Kingdom or maybe France or Germany or Japan or Canada. And so we are looking at a plan to also engage with them to help inform how they are approaching this from a national uh, regulatory standpoint. Um, and I think in closing, I'll just say that, you know, we, we see this as important uh, because, you know, we realize that while the government has a lot of experience in doing these things, as, as Kevin shared, you know, there are challenges in the government kind of sharing what it's doing and what it's learning. So if we can get the industry mobilized to start looking at this and start sharing their experiences, um, just like what had it sort of happened in the civil aviation world where the industry standards sort of set the stage for a system where we can have, you know, a vibrant commercial industry that's providing capabilities, uh, that we think is sort of what we see as the future where CONFERS is taking the satellite servicing world. So I'll stop there. And go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Okay, so now we have the time for Q&A. Again, if you have questions, please feel free to use the conference app or send it to sif.ly. I'm curious to know if anyone on the panel can talk about times when SSA has identified irresponsible practices for RPO activities, say perhaps by another country. <laughs> Kevin, you want to take that one? Okay, so I'll, I'll take a start of that. So um, <laughs> I will say that there have been a handful of 
rendezvous and prox operations that did not go as planned. Uh, so on the US side, you know, NASA had a program called DART that was supposed to autonomously rendezvous with another satellite called Mobilecom, um, and they ended up bumping into it, which was not planned. And the, the after action report for that, there is actually an unclassified version that you can go read. So, so that's an example of one that did not go as planned. Um, I have written about uh, a, a certain Chinese rendezvous and prox op that happened uh, in 2010, uh, where based on the, uh, the TLE analysis, there's a change in energy of the object that was being rendezvoused with um, that is consistent with a bump. Now, there was no debris that came out of that or anything, but it was, it was to me, it looked pretty clear that it did, probably did not go as planned. Um, so I would say those are two examples. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to add that uh, also I think you need to think about what your strategy is for the RPO and take a safe, take a safe approach, take a safe plan. For example, there are trajectories, passively safe trajectories, where um, the uh, object that's closing in can, can, uh, um, can come in, and if it loses control, it is not on the same plane, it is not on an intersection um, trajectory unless it's continued to be controlled on into the, to the, uh, to the hard dock. So at any point uh, along that path, if, if control is, is lost, it goes off, right? So, um, and there was a NASA mission that hopefully will fly by the end of this year with two 3U CubeSats called CPOD that had that, that was gonna fly that sort of strategy of passively safe uh, R, RPO um, that was gonna be autonomous on board. And I hope it does fly. But, uh, I, so I think that uh, there are things that can be done in your strategy that can inherently make them more safe. I'll add that, uh, so interesting, Brian talked about the, the NASA DART mission. So when I took over the Third Space Experimentation Squadron, one of our core competencies is to develop uh, advanced orbital mechanics expertise. So we, we send all of our guys to advanced orbital mechanics training, um, and I literally had the, the full copy of the NASA mishap report on, on DART, and we, uh, we reviewed that, scrubbed it, um, and developed multiple, I think um, five specific lessons learned that we incorporated it into our RPO basic training. So every member of my squadron literally learns best practices and lessons learned from, from mishaps, from things that have, did not go as planned, uh, and, and ensure that we have those as a basis for doing them smartly moving forward. So mm -hmm. it's kind of great that you had that. I don't have anything to, I mean, you've heard it from the, the people that know the military side. On the civil side, you know, the, the passively safe trajectory is, is sort of the best practice, right? So we, and we've been doing that for, you know, when we resupply the International Space Station with our Cygnus vehicle, when we did the Hubble repairs and was, we approached with the shuttle, I mean, there's a long history of RPO operations that are safe and controllable with both parties fully witting and cognizant of, of what's uh, going on. And that's really the only thing that we're, we're planning to do commercially. Uh, now there's a couple, I would say, either philosophical or definitional questions that are coming up. You know, what is proximity? Is it 100 kilometers? Is it one kilometer? Um, and at what point does it be considered um, an RPO, a close approach, is considered a threat to the resident spacecraft? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> so, uh, um, Tell you one thing, so, so there's a lot of uh, exceptional space professionals in the Air Force that have been doing amazing things, but one, one of the fundamental things that's different about executing rendezvous and proximity ops is, is the switch from, from viewing things Keplerian, like element sets that you, you know, normally do from launch and every space class you've ever taken, to radial and track cross-track, to actually, when you, when you have to reorient your operation to be viewing things in a radial intract cross-track perspective, I, I think you're, you've kind of moved into that RPO regime, right? Up until that point, when you're, when you're traversing out to the geo belt and you're still using Keplerian element sets and you're, and you're figuring out what your eccentricity is and how you need to adjust things, um, that's, that's kind of the, the God's eye view of, of a space operation. When, when you have to move into that, that RIC frame, I, I would submit that's probably a good point that you're doing RPOs. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree. When you're considering trying to get close when you're in the far field, I think you're still working on, on accomplishing the rendezvous. 
and uh, when you're within then that field where you're focusing on that object and with your closing strategy, I think you've, you've now come into the proximity ops yeah. realm. Uh, hey, from our perspective, you know, we're talking about the, the commercial stuff and there by definition, it's, it's cooperative. And so the, 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 the customer um, has said, you know, I, I would like you to approach me to do something, whether it's an inspection or whether it's a, uh, a docking or whether it's refueling or something. Uh, and so, you know, so in that, in that case, you know, it's pretty obvious that this is gonna come along. Uh, I would say, you know, one other aspect to think about though is it's not just about distance. Um, energy plays a role in this as well because there are orbits that may seem close that are not because of the energy involved to move from one to the other and there are orbits that, that may seem to be very far away that are not because of the, there's very little energy required. So that, that along with Kevin's, you know, uh, this, the, uh, the orbital dynamics here are a huge part of this and it's something that you know we struggle with because we we think of physics from our experience based on how you know cars and trucks move and how airplanes move which is not how satellites move um, in fact I was talking to a bunch of uh, military lawyers in Omaha a couple weeks ago and uh, I was basically saying uh, you know basically trying to explain some of the or mechanics of how you do an RPO and saying well if you thrust in this direction your orbit changes this way and you end up doing a little loop-de-loop -loop around, you know, the target. You drop behind it and below it, and it's totally non-intuitive from the, you know, our, you know, sort of experience with physics here about how that would happen, but that's what happens in space. So let me, let me just add one thing on, uh, you know, writing on Brian's comment about energy involved. We actually added a second, we were only going to do electric propulsion, but we added uh, a more, um, you know, control authority hydrazine system for the, the closing operations so that we did have positive control and author enough authority to maneuver out of the way if, if uh, things w didn't go as exactly as planned. So it, it is an energy discussion. Uh, there's, thank you. There's also a couple questions here talking about um, cooperative and non-cooperative RPO. Um, so far, the implication is that a non-cooperative RPO could possibly be military or hostile in intent. But a couple of the questions focus on whether or not it's commercial in terms of um, industrial espionage, proprietary information, things like that. Um, how do you guys intend to respond? Or think you might respond? I, I'll let the others answer more thoroughly, but you know, it is in our future business plan um, to do active debris removal. Um, and uh, those, most debris is not, uh, you know, under control. And, but we will, we do plan on making an attempt to contact the owning state uh, so that it is not, you know, an unknown thing, uh, an unknown approach. And then notify all the right authorities as we're, we're doing that. We're not going to just do that and then come back and ask for, to get paid afterwards. I'll stop. Uh, I'll, so for the missions we've flown and are, are flying with uh, Air Force Research Lab right now, uh, ANGELS obviously was, was non-cooperative, it was just a rocket body, it was the F Space 4 upper stage that we flew against and so we had to work on our skills to, to, uh, for flying our POs with a non-cooperative target. Uh, with, with the Eagle and Mycroft spacecraft, uh, those can be cooperative. We have, we have two that we were flying both, both assets. So uh, for us, it's an opportunity again for developing TTPs and lessons learned with, with being able to advance the, the skill set, as it were, of, of RPOs. Um, and I'll just leave it there. So uh, I also heard in, in that question the possibility of a commercial activity that could have some uh, sinister aspects to it, right? Uh, uh, that uh, impinge on someone else's privacy, right? And so uh, the analogy I used before about the bedroom window being open and, and uh, uh, so is, uh, you know, I, th I think we do have a right um, uh, and industrial companies have a right to, for, to privacy and, and to uh, keep their proprietary information proprietary. So I think if a commercial company is not following what their license permits them to do, I think there's a role of a regulator in here that, that may um, uh, need to evaluate what that behavior is. And you know, if that behavior is um, approaching other commercial spacecraft 
to um, perform industrial uh, espionage or, or to gain industrial information on them, I think that there should be some there should be controls on 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 that. Uh, I uh, um, let me just leave it there. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I would say, first of all, I'm disappointed this audience is so pessimistic about always going to all the very bad things that can happen. You know, there's a lot of good things that can happen too. Uh, I mean, first of all, I mean, it, it starts with having good SSA, right? I mean, if you're monitoring and, and doing, you know, persistent SSA across the, the geo belt, um, you're going to know when things move. Yeah. And you're going to be able to, you know, predict where it's going to go in the future and be like, hey, this thing just moved. It appears to be drifting that way, right? Th that is the, the first step to all of this is just kind of that kind of monitoring. And the 18th does a pretty good job of that today. And as the commercial companies and other countries come online, there's going to be more of that. Uh, and, and so, you know, making, having that data public and easily accessible is the very first step to, to be able to keep tabs on all this. Because it might not be nefarious, it might be, you know, another Galaxy 15 zombie sat where they just kind of lost control and it started drifting. Um, so it, it starts with that. Um, the, the second piece of that, uh, you had said something I was going to follow up on. So the, um, possibly the uh, role of a regulator? In, oh, in yes, this? role of a regulator. Yeah. Um, that is something that currently does not, uh, it sort of exists in that the U.S. government, uh, if you get a remote sensing license, they do allow you now to do remote sensing of other space objects, but there's some very strict guidelines there. One of them is uh, you are only allowed to do image another, uh, another satellite with consent of that satellite's operator. So some of that does exist, but as far as I know, it only exists for U.S. entities. Uh, that same licensing restriction does not exist for other countries yet. And that gets back to this question about, you know, there is no globally mandated regulatory governance system for this. It comes down to each country putting in place the national licenses uh, uh, to kind of provide oversight for this and monitor for this. Uh, and that's going to be challenging to do that consistently across every country that's out there flying satellites. Yeah, I think there needs to be a bright line and a, a clear understanding. What is a casual observation, which is a metric observation looking across the geo belt, which is non-nefarious versus a high resolution look-see and figure out what, what their antenna configuration is, uh, which has other purposes. And so, so, they're, so I, you know, I, I don't know where, how you draw that line. I think it's, it, it could be straightforward how you do it, but I think that we need to discern between the two. Yeah. So as a commercial operator, I am not anxious for an international um, regulatory authority. Um, <laughs> I think the, the U.S. is sufficient, um, but it is a good discussion, and I will tell you that in our contract with our clients, we protect the intellectual property of the manufacturer of our client's satellite, which may not, in fact, be us, um, and that's part of the deal. Thank you. Um, some questions about, you know, the idea of SSA to support best practices, but... Um, the idea of enforcement, Brian, you brought it up a little bit that it has to be done at the national level, but are there any other discussions in terms of how do you enforce these best practices and standards? Well, I, I would just, I mean, I, I mean, some people have a problem with the, using the word enforcement in line with best practices uh, because voluntary best <coughs> practices are, are that, they're voluntary. Uh, but I, so I would probably maybe more monitoring. Um, and, and there's some gentle nudging, but that, that's, a, that's a really good point. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Dick talked about the, the effort that's been going on at UN Copius the last eight years to develop international guidelines and best practices, voluntary, for doing a whole host, whole host of activities. Uh, and, and, you know, there, I guess I would go back to, you know, things like better SSA and public catalogs uh, and, and things that combine different sources of SSA uh, is probably, I would say, the, the starting point. Um, you know, it's interesting, there's, outside of the space world, there's a whole host of NGOs and other entities that have cropped up that have started using, like, commercial satellite imagery to go take a look at things. And, and they started to say, hey, you know, this shipping that's going on over here is not happening the way it's supposed to be happening. Right, and they're showing satellite imagery. They're showing, you know, uh, tracking uh, from uh, some of the commercial shipping, or they're highlighting 
um, you know, uh, uh, piracy potential or illegal phishing, uh, and they're raising awareness of that, and that is actually having a behavioral impact. So it doesn't always have to be a government that is going in and saying, you know, don't do this, don't do this. That there is, I think, a growing ability to kind of name and shame from non-government entities as well. I think the, uh, and Brian, you, you hit it, it's, it's less about enforcing the best practices. You know, it, the best practices should incentivize behavior. I mean, it should be inherent that it's smart. Uh, so for instance, uh, Jim talked about passively safe uh, profiles. We, we learned early on that uh, to invoke cross-track in our, in our profiles, right, so that, we, so that we have the ability to drift away if we lose contact with the, with the satellite at any given point, right? That's a smart practice, and you don't have to incentivize that because nobody wants to crash when you don't want to crash, right? So um, we, uh, for angels, we, the first time we were uh, you know, showing how we could fly these missions, all of our operations were done several hundred kilometers above the geo belt. Why? Because if they go bad or if you have an issue with it or you can't recover something, you're already in the junk belt, okay? No harm, no foul. So, so there, are sm there are smart practices that I think, y you, if done correctly, you don't have to enforce, you don't have to convince people to do things smartly. They will inherently see that that's the, the, the wise way to do business, to do things. So. So you heard it here first, the U.S. Space Force is um, contracted for 150 MEVs uh, to do enforcement of... That's what I heard. Of, that's, that's, that's exactly what I heard right there. So, so that's kidding, a, kidding. Yeah. It's a non-cooperative movement, right? You're going to be like, hey, move over there, right? You're going to force it. Don't take that and close my bedroom window. Those are things I've learned. Yeah. Good luck cashing that check. Well, we're getting, we're getting close to time. Um, I just wanted to ask the panel in general, let's say we were to have this discussion again in five years, what do you think are going to be the big issues at that point? If you could sum it up in 30 seconds, that would be I'll, great. I'll tell you, so, um, so there, there have been some very, very historic things that have occurred in, in space situational awareness world, right? So uh, I was the, the day shift uh, in Cheyenne Mountain on January 11th, 2007. Uh, I, I updated the last element set on FY1C, and then Brian came in that evening, and, uh, and all hell broke loose, right? And so, so um, there, there were some norms of behavior that, 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 be, that, that started to occur. The next morning, everyone said, well, you know, how did this happen? What's going on? And we started to figure out smarter ways to do business, there are ways to track things, and, and the fallout, you know, the, we could talk at length about that. I think as we move into the in RPO at the GeoBell, as we start to normalize some of the operations, as we start to see what worked, um, when it hasn't worked, a uh, smart way to do business, it, 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 will, it will normalize. The, the best practices will, will normalize and, and uh, it'll be routine. I think uh, one of the, uh, I, I think attribution. I think we may, we may be talking about methods of attribution, how to have certainty of what you believe you saw and, and how that attribution may be, um, uh, be consistent with legal needs uh, as, as uh, uh, as more capability hits the geo belt and as um, both uh, uh, co um, intentional and unintentional uh, activities occur, uh, we may, I, I think we need, um, I think we'll be talking about attribution and, and what does the data tell us, what was their intent. And um, uh, so I think that, uh, I think that may be, uh, and, and what was the body of evidence? Uh, I mean, I would, I would hope that at that point we're going to have several different commercial missions that have done some initial demos or they've actually started operations and we're going to have some examples and then we're going to have a discussion about uh, anomalies and some sharing of actual here's something that went, that didn't go quite according to the plan um, and here's how we resolve that uh, and that's going to be discussed within the community and that's going to help improve the next generation. That's what I hope we're doing five years from now. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to predict for right, 5 years from now that there will be some active, you know, satellite servicing and related activities ongoing. I'm also going to predict that space is going to be at least by the US declared as public space open to imagery um, and last um, there will be a robust discuss discussion here at Amos about debris removal and um, what is it, um, the, the rights for just harvesting old dead stuff um, and doing things with it that way. That'll be sort of the, the top debate. And I yield the floor. Thank you. <laughs>
All right, well, we'll see in 2023 how we're doing, but those all sound like very interesting propositions. Please join me in thanking the panel for a wonderful conversation. Thank you.